Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh um, This episode is going to be inshallah an episode which is focused around Christianity and Judaism and some of the common questions that are asked around those two religion and its um, correspondence or uh, relationship with Islam So let's take a look at the first question Do Jesus believe Jesus was sinless? Generally Muslims believe that all the prophets were masum, masum meaning that they were sinless that they were they did not commit the the major sins for as a matter of fact uh, some scholars say that um, you know some some of the uh, prophets uh, could it's possible for them to make mistakes and or even commit some of the minor sins and some cite Adam and he being a prophet of Islam falling from the tree you know uh, uh, eating from the tree etc as an example of that but if I were to give you my answer I'd say yes Jesus is sinless and all of the prophets are sinless according to Islam is Jesus being called the word of Allah the same as the Quran no it says kalimatun um, kalimatun minhu means that it is a word and the word is actually defined as kun it's defined in chapter 3 verse 59 of the Quran that uh, in the method Isa and عند الله كمثل Adam خلقهم من تراب ثم قال له كن فيكون that certainly the similitude of Jesus uh, to Allah is like that of Adam he created him from خلقهم من تراب from mud and or uh, from dust and he said to him كن and he said كن so this is the word that has been referred to and when you do exegesis uh, the hermeneutical approach is you do تفسير القرآن بالقرآن and so when it says كلمة منه the word here that has been referred to is kun and that is referred to in chapter 3 verse 59 of the Quran meaning be and whenever Allah wants anything he says be and it is and that is even the case with uh, that is even the case with the creation of Jesus who was a man who was the Messiah and from this perspective who was the word of Allah as well is there a proof that Christianity had ever um, had a monotheistic group yes there is proof of that uh, as documented by many people who have um, written uh, about it and I've, it's got some books here that you can refer to it's your lucky day and I've got a book uh, you can refer to to prove my, my point this is a nice um, book um, it's called Christianity the first 3000 years uh, and it tells you, it gives you especially if you look from chapter uh, maybe from around you know, uh, so if you look here, for example, from maybe about maybe a hundred page, a hundred onwards, would would give you a good image of that. Uh, another book which is very good is called Early Christian Doctrines by G. N. D. Kelly. This is one of the best books that have been written on this topic. This, this book here is called Early Christian Doctrines. It's the fifth edition. It will also give you uh, that information for those who uh, want it. It's called Early Christian uh, Doctrines. Another interesting book um, to understand Christianity is this book here. It's called The Making of the Creeds by Francis Young. It's a very small book and it gives you all the creeds. Uh, this won't answer that question, but it will give you an understanding of the development of Christianity. Um, as well as... Uh, this book here by James Dunn uh, and James Dunn has an interesting perspective on Christianity uh, which I'll explain in a second Bart Ehrman also a very interesting scholar wrote this book called How Jesus Became God now these are some of the, the titles that we can look at to answer this question um, this one in particular I think is probably the, the most important book to give you the answer just in a nutshell uh, the answer is yes there were and they were called the Ebonites now they were in the beginning of uh, when Christianity, uh, when Jesus Christ disappeared in 33 AD, according to the majority of historians, um, some of the, ma the main groups uh, to first come out of that, in terms of understanding of who Jesus Christ was, was a group called, one of the groups called the Ebonites, and they're traced back to around 70 AD, which is a good 40 years or even 30, 35 years um, after the disappearance of Christ, which is a very early group, and they believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. They believed that he was a prophet, but they did not believe that he was God or the Son. Um, they, not, they did not believe, they didn't ascribe any divinity to Jesus whatsoever. So it's possible to say uh, that the 
conception of Jesus as a prophet and Messiah, but not as a divine co-equal of God, which is the Islamic position from this perspective, was found in the early days of Christianity. But it was, uh, but the Christian position or the Nicene position, the 381 Nicene position, was not uh, in the environment after Jesus' disappearance up until uh, the time of the Cappadocian Fathers, which is about 380 AD. Obviously, there was discussions in 320s uh, and, Ni and Nicene Creed and all these things. But the whole, f I mean, if you look at the Nicene Creed, you will not find um, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit as a co equal with God even then. So, uh, that's an interesting point. It's a good question. And there were early Christians that did believe in a pure monotheism, a pristine monotheism, the same pristine monotheism that Muslims believe in. Uh, and that is the, the way of the Jewish, uh, the Old Testament, the Tanakh. Does the Quran say the Bible was preserved? It does not say that the Bible was preserved. In fact, the word Bible comes from the Greek word Biblios, which, which simply means book. And this word is not mentioned in uh, the Quran to, in reference to the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalms like that. Yes, Al-Kitab is mentioned. Uh, but when we're talking about Al-Kitab, we are talking about either the, old, uh, sorry, either the Torah or the Injil or the Zabur. And these are the things that are mentioned by name in the Quran. We cannot go above and beyond this. And there are many verses in the Quran which indicate to the contrary. In fact, one of the most prominent ones is chapter number 33, verse number 75 uh, until 78. And you can look at, for example, where the, the, the siyakh, the context starts with وَمِنْ أَهْلِ kitab. Going back to verse 78, it says وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَلْوُونَ أَلْسِنَتُهُمْ بِالْكِتَابِ لِتَحْسَبُوهُ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَيَقُولُونَ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ وَمَا هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ uh, which means that, that from the Jews and the Christians, there are those who believe, who say that it's, it's from God, i.e. these parts of the book are from God, and it's not from God. And they, and they, they say it's, uh, it's part of the book, and it's not part of the book. They say it's from God, it's not part of God's word. And there are many different uh, verses like this. Um, so we, the, the, the final answer is no. Uh, and the Quran refers to itself as Muhaymin, which means a guardian, which means it deciphers between uh, the haqq and the batil, the truth and the falsehood. Uh, and it does so particularly in relation to the old scriptures. And there are hadith on this as well. Um, and so therefore we do not believe that the, uh, the book is preserved. Now, next question. Did the Prophet Muhammad just copy the Bible and the Jewish apoc apoc Apocrypha? The answer is no, because, and a good way of understanding this, and I've done a video on this, which you can check on YouTube, just write down, you know, copy, copied the Bible, Muhammad Hijab, or something like this, and you'll get a better answer. There are historical reasons for us to believe that that was not the case. For example, the errors, the historical errors that the Bible has, that the Quran does not have. For example, particularly regarding to Yusuf and his story. Uh, we know, for example, that Yusuf in the Quran is referred to as a, uh, he refers to the, the authority in charge in Egypt as a king whereas the Bible refers to him as a pharaoh. And from the dating of the Bible, we know that actually at the time of Joseph, um, that there was a king in charge of Egypt at that time for, for the interim, interim period. And uh, more discussion can be made uh, done about this, but the point is that there are lots of reasons for us to assume that the Quran did not copy uh, the Old and New Testament of them, these historical realities. And moreover, uh, just on this point, it's really quite interesting because that information was only known to us. Yes, it was only known to us when the when the Rosetta Stone was presented to us sometime in the 1800s. So it couldn't have been accessed by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How could he discern, and how could he fix the historical errors of the Bible so as to take from the Bible, fix it historically, and put it into the Quran? There must have been a divine intervention, which is our uh, point. And just on the point of the Christian scriptures, this is a very important point as well. That in the year 1945, there was, uh, in the year 1945, there was a discovery of, um, uh, of what you call Gnostic texts. Uh, in 1945, Gnostic texts were discovered uh, in Egypt, uh, in a place called Minya, which uh, is well known in Upper Egypt. Uh, in 1945 and it's referred to as the Nag Hammadi Library and in this Nag Hammadi Library you have many different uh, new texts which have been discovered among among them are the 
is, for example, the, the, uh, the Gospel of St. Thomas. And what's really interesting about the Gospel of St. Thomas is that it has some of the information about Jesus Christ that's not even mentioned in the four Gospels. For example, the, fa the fact that Jesus Christ, he, he made a, uh, a clay bird and then the, that bird uh, became uh, life, it became animate. Uh, and the fact that Prophet, uh, that, uh, that Jesus, Prophet Jesus, he spoke in the cradle, which is mentioned in chapter 19 of the Quran, verse uh, 29 to 30. The point being is, had this information been, how comes the Prophet had this information and it wasn't available in the Arabic? It was not available in the Arabic. It wasn't even available in the Coptic until 1945, because that is the original language of a lot of the, uh, the texts of the Nag Hammadi library and uh, so therefore we'll say that is if you want to make the claim that there was copying going on then how can you explain these things how can you explain the fact that he had access to material which had only been made uh, we, we've only had access to it after all these years so these are sh strong arguments I believe and obviously anyone can say anyone copied from anyone I mean I could say that the Christians copied from the Jews uh, a lot look at the book of Acts and compare it to the Old Testament Look, the Shema is being referred to all over the old, uh, the New Testament, which is a new, old, uh, the New Testament, which is a Old Testament verse, Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four. We can, uh, some Orientalists even say that the Old Testament was copied from the Gilgamesh uh, texts because of the Babylonian influence. So where does it end? We say that look, the reason why you'll find an intersection of similarity between all these texts is because we believe there was a divine intervention as soon as human beings came on the earth and there were prophets who sent a similar message the Quran says لا نفرق بين أحد من رسولي. we do not differentiate between any of the prophets so that is why you'll find um, uh, similarities between different books of the past uh, so just moving on is the book given to Jesus i.e. the Injil the same uh, gospels that the Christians have today. Well, the, you got to ask an interesting question. The gospels that Christians have today, how did they become to be canonized in the first place? It, they were not canonized as soon as Jesus was there. I mean, in the year 33, when he was di when he disappeared, the the uh, the New Testament corpus, as it became to be known with all 27 books, was not uh, was did not just simply arrange itself. It was an organic process that took many hundreds of years. It wasn't in Nicaea, which is a, miscon a historical misconception, that in the year in 325 in the Council of Nicaea, that somehow the New Testament was being uh, formulated by those people in, in there. That didn't happen. It was an organic process, which took a long process, so, uh, time, hundreds of years, for there to be a final uh, draft, if you like, of the New Testament. Uh, and But there was a widespread consensus that the four Gospels the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were uh, some somewhat reliable uh, gospels, but that's neither here nor there for us. The gospel that Muslims believe in is the gospel according to Jesus, not the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Not to say that those books, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, don't have elements of truth in them. Just like, for example, the Gospel of Thomas probably has a lot of elements of truth in that as well. So, um, and the proof of that is that the the texts of the divine texts are meant to be inspirations from God and by admission I mean if you look at the book of Luke for example it's meant to be some kind of a, a narrative account based on those individuals who we don't know who they exactly are I mean John could be three different people according to historians the point being is uh, to put this in a nutshell we don't believe that those four Gospels represent the exact teachings of Jesus Christ I don't think any modern historian believes that either uh, there are discrepancies and contradictions within the Gospels, I mean, the four Gospels themselves, I mean. So, uh, we believe in the initial Gospel revealed to Jesus. The, uh, the question here is, if the Bible can be dated to the 3rd century, how can Muslims consider it changed? The Bible cannot be dated to the 3rd century. Uh, that's, a that's a historical misnomer. Uh, once again, the third century is 200 AD. That's what we're talking about. And at this time, um, al although you had some Gnostic individuals who had made um, their own short list of what should be in the canon, if you like, uh, it wasn't 
a an agreement among any Christian group that this is the c canon, and the canon became to be known as what it is today, maybe somewhere in the fourth century, but it was certainly not the twenty seventh books. Uh, Athanasius, he, who uh, he was the first to recommend the twenty seven books of the New Testament, did so probably somewhere around three hundred and twenty six, which is actually the fourth century and not the second century, anyways. So, to answer your question. The Bible was not known as the Bible until somewhere in the, maybe the 4th or 5th century. Uh, we're talking about quite a long time uh, anyway. So this, the question is, uh, it's got a mis misnomer in it, a historical misnomer. Uh, does the verse in chapter 19.33 in the Quran indicate that Jesus died and was resurrected? The verse in question is, وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ وَلِدْتُ وَيَوْمَ أَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ أُبْعَثُ Where Jesus he says, وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ that peace be upon me the day is chapter 19 verse 33 that the day I was born and the day I will die and the day I will be resurrected what's the problem the same thing was said about John in the same surah in chapter 19 of the Quran so does that mean Jesus was also in the same I mean people that use this as a as an evidence of completely mis mistaken for doing so uh, does the verse indicate that Jesus died and resurrected? no because yawma amutu wa yawma ubaathu hayya the day I will die so he hasn't died yet wa yawma ubaathu the day I will be resurrected is talking about future events just like with jo uh, John in the same chapter is talking about future events if Prophet Muhammad is dead and Jesus is still alive wouldn't that make Jesus better? Uh, no uh, it, it, it doesn't and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as with all people who die they continue living Haya Barzakhiya which is a, a living a life in the Barzakh if you're talking about why is it the fact that Jesus is still alive in his body uh, and his soul versus the fact that Prophet Muhammad isn't does that make one more uh, b uh, better than the other what is the criteria of establishing this because if that was the case then look at the Bible you have someone like Melchizedek, who's mentioned in the Old Testament, who had no beginning and had no end. But at the same time, you had other characters which Christians would agree is better that are better than Melchizedek's prophets and messengers. So even from a biblical standpoint, that doesn't make any sense. Um, was uh, was Hajar considered? Abraham's concubine or wife. She was considered his comp concubine. Yes. Would God send uh, sending a sheep to be sacrificed instead of Ismail be considered? What would that be? Yes, uh, it's it's con that's one of the celebrations in Eid that instead of it was a test of Ab Ibrahim of Abraham, and he was able to meet that test by. Um, by uh, going following through with something, and then the, and then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala told him, no, you don't need to uh, sacrifice your son. You can sacrifice the sheep instead, and that was something we would do now, um, sacrificially uh, in Eid, the second Eid, the big Eid, if you like, um, after the 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 nine days of Dhul Hijjah, and which is one of the rites that we do in Hajj as well, and it's a, it's a, it's an emblem emblem, if you like, of the submission of the Muslim to to worship and follow Allah in all cases even though you might not know the rationality of something or the reasoning behind something and it was best uh, epitomized by Ibrahim himself if the Jews today are monotheists why does Islam say they are astray well the simple answer to that is that the Quran does not depict uh, Jews as fully monotheistic and frankly although they might believe in one God the kind of one God that they believe in is an anthropomorphized God. It's, it is a weak God in some circumstances. If you look at the book of Genesis. Literally, you find God, the Father, walking as a man in the Garden of Eden. I mean, what's he doing there as a man? How did God all, all of a sudden become a man in the Garden of Eden? What's even more surprising is that he repents in the Bible to the children of Israel. A God repenting? What kind of weak God is this? Likewise, you find him wrestling with Jacob and losing the wrestling match. I mean, I don't, I don't see how such a God. Uh, 
uh, could be defined thus with such characteristics obviously him resting on the seventh day is a problem so the characteristics of God as per the Old Testament there are some things which Muslims would take exception with there's no doubt but if we're talking about the one God that's mentioned the Shema this is uh, half of the Shahada if you like uh, if they believe in that God without any of these deficiencies which we could not and would not describe ascribe to uh, his character then it's halfway there all they need to do now is to believe in the final messenger just as they had to believe in Moses I mean there was a time where people had to believe in Moses and there and there were prophets before Moses who came and the Jews believed in those prophets before Moses so just like the prophets had been tested by believing in Moses now they're being tested by believing in the final prophet Muhammad and before him even Jesus the Messiah who was uh, who was predicted all over the Old Testament which they have also rejected now um, if Muslims believe ruling by Muhammad made laws is wrong then why did Allah tell people to rule by the Bible the verse in question is in chapter 5 of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, that let the Ahlul Injil, the Injil, the people of the Injil, of the actual Injil, rule from that which is in therein. It doesn't say let them rule in the whole book. The whole book is not seen as, as we said before, uh, as authoritative. Therein, there is some things there which are true. And those things correspond with the Quran. And the evidence of that is that the actual Isbab al Nuzul of this verse was that there were Jewish and Christian people. The Jews came to the Prophet Muhammad and asked him to rule between them on a matter of adultery, etc. And the Prophet told them, and this is mentioned in the tafsirs, for example, Ibn Kathir and Tabari and others, to bring their own book and to to uh, point at the verse and whatever and they were trying to hide the verse where it's talking about the capital punishment the death penalty that would be given to the adulterer so it's not the case that um, it's not the case that all of the books and all of its rulings are correct and the Quran does not indicate that as we've uh, before proven when Allah said no one can change his words does this mean that all revealed scriptures can never be corrupted well no one can change Allah's words but Allah makes a mention of, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5 of the Qur'an, He makes a mention of who He placed in charge of the preservation of the Old Testament and the, uh, of the uh, Torah and the Injil. By saying, بِمَسْتُحْفِظُوا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَكَانُوا عَلَيْهِ شُهَدَاءِ That they, i.e. the rabbis and those individuals, the, the rabbis, etc., that they were placed in charge of the preservation of their books they were witnesses over that preservation therefore them not uh, them not being able to uh, preserve the book was something that goes back to them the blame goes back to them so it's as if Allah devolved with his ultimate power the responsibility to these subgroups to, the, these um, scholars of uh, of Ahl Kitab to take this responsibility and they have failed to preserve the book this this is the Quranic message when uh, Prophet Muhammad Hassan conquered Mecca did he enjoy all the idols except for Jesus and Mary no this is not correct he in, he destroyed all of the idols and Jesus and Mary were not of the idols that were around the Kaaba there was 360 uh, idols and as far as we know Jesus and Mary as I don't know if you mean a, a, a depiction of them or a statue figure of them or if you mean uh, them physically, but either way, certainly they weren't. They were not there. The Quran says Jesus made a pigeon come to life out of mud. Doesn't that prove that he's God? First of all, it doesn't say pigeon. It says bird. And secondly, he says that bi idnillah in both chapter three of the Quran and chapter five, by the permission of Allah. Every time Allah talks about a, a, the a Jesus doing this, he, he mentions bi idnillah. By the permission of Allah. Now, why did Allah allow people from uh, to worship Jesus for 600 years before Islam? Well, it's not like all of them were worshiping Jesus. That's a misconception. It's a misunderstanding of the groups that existed in the time of Jesus and after 
after the time of Jesus. There were those monotheists who refused to worship Jesus or take him as divine altogether. And there was those Jews who obviously, uh, we would say wrongfully, but were monotheistic, they wrongfully, uh, sorry, uh, de 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 declined the messiahship or the messengerhood or the prophethood of Jesus Christ. But they were not polytheists in the same way as we would argue would be the case with these tritheist Christians who then emerged. So th the point is, the timing is based on the wisdom of Allah, who has all knowledge and he knows exactly when the best time and uh, when the best place, where the best place is for revelation. And that is, uh, was in the Arabian Peninsula at the time where the Prophet Muhammad was a messenger. And uh, the New Jerome Catholic Encyclopedia says it best in page 461, saying that actually before the the message of uh, I'm paraphrasing here of course, but the the message of um, Christianity was kind of convoluted, and only the the true monotheistic teachings of uh, Jesus were only to be reborn with Islam, and that is the end of the question so these are the end of the questions uh, on Christianity and I hope that answers all of your uh, misconceptions or misnomers that you may have Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh